So let's go ahead and get started. Um, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to this year's Kennedy Award Lecture. Our Kennedy Award recipient is Jonathan Dombrowski, who um, who is going to talk to us about fishing and the nature cultural culture dichotomy. Um, John came to us at UNM he, uh, from the University of North Texas, where he received both his bachelor's in anthropology and his master's of science in applied geography. He is currently a PhD, PhD candidate in the archaeology program um, here at UNM. He's also a Hibben doctoral research fellow, and he is a research associate of the Crow Canyon Research Institute. Um, John's dissertation is funded by an NSF Doctoral Dissertation Improvement Award, and it focuses on understanding ancestral Pueblo fishing strategies in the middle Rio Grande of New Mexico, um, and particularly in the Pueblo IV period. He's generally, a, he's generally fascinated by zooarchaeology in this late pre-Hispanic and early historic period, and he's also been involved um, with projects that focus on raptor management and on garden hunting. Um, so John, take it away. We're looking forward to it. Awesome. Here, let me get my screen shared appropriately and everything set up. Oh, that was quick. Can everyone, everyone see this? See the pointer? Let's get a thumbs up. Looks good. Awesome. Thanks, Ian. Um, so I just, um, I just have to say that I'm, I'm, I'm. A little tired this week. I've, I submitted my uh, dissertation draft to my committee on Tuesday. Um, and so my goal for this talk was to have a little fun. Um, I hope that's what we can have. Uh, I'm going to get into some crazy topics, some crazy diverse topics. I'd like this to be a little more informal. Um, so if any, any, if anyone's got anything to talk about. If if I rush over something, I sometimes get excited and talk really fast. Feel free to interrupt and we can spend some time on, on a certain slide. That's completely fine. Um, so about two thirds of this talk is really focused on this right here, this nature culture dichotomy. Um, and it's set up so you can kind of understand my background a little bit and understand why does John care so much about this? And he seems really hung up on it. It's because I am <laughs> or I have been. Um, and so I'm kind of going to give you a kind of trajectory of um, my training a little bit. And then uh, the last third of this talk is really kind of going forward with how I've kind of come to terms a little bit with the nature culture dichotomy and have been applying it in my uh, dissertation research. So with that being said, this there is three general kind of <laughs> kind of how I've, org I've organized this talk with three um, general categories in mind. Um, actually, let me back up a second. Sorry. Uh, when I'm talking about the nature culture dichotomy, um, basically what I'm talking about is the um, is how we as humans place ourselves in the, the environment. That's really the, the this dichotomy that I'm talking about. Um, are we apart from nature or are we the are, are we similar to it, right? And anthropologists have been talking about this forever. So, uh, so catching back up, three general kind of parts to this talk. The first one is kind of a, a, an accounting of how I have developed some academic insecurities. Um, and then the second part is how I've kind of, you know, as I've gotten more training, how I've started to cope and kind of some of my different coping mechanisms, uh, theoretical coping mechanisms, um, how I've coped with the nature culture dichotomy. And then the third part is how I've kind of, I'm trying to move forward with it um, and kind of accept it in my dissertation research and hopefully forward into my career. So let's get started um, with the first part. So academic insecurities. I came into archaeology from um, kind of, I got really snagged into it from human ecology. Um, and I was really interested in zoo archaeology, which is the study of human, uh, from a study of animal remains from archaeological sites to answer questions about um, the foraging behavior of past people. So here I am right here. This is, this is John about a decade ago. He's got a much rounder face. He's got a little baby beard. 
and John, right now in this picture, he is thinking to my to himself, what have I got myself into? And he's thinking this particularly because, like I said, he's really interested in animal bones and foraging behavior and environmental processes, but something is happening in the discipline. Um, and when this picture was taken, it was around the 2010s. Um, and in terms of my training, I caught the tail end of something that I call the diamond wars, okay? And so if anyone, um, if any, probably a lot of people in the audience, or probably a lot of faculty members are, uh, they, they know the diamond war as well, uh, and they're tired of hearing about it, um, but it was really influential uh, on me. Uh, it felt really um, poignant and specific and like, oh my God, I cannot not pay attention to this. So I'm gonna go over the history of this a little bit of what I'm calling the diamond wars. Um, uh, to kind of get, if people don't know exactly what this is, um, maybe it didn't, This di people have probably heard about it, um, but they, I don't know if it has felt so important to them, but it was important to me. So Jared Diamond in 1997 publishes a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel. And in this book, he took it upon himself uh, to answer a very large question. And that question was, why is there global economic inequality? Um, but the way that he went about doing this basically just infuriated anthropologists and social scientists the world over. The reason he says there's global economic inequality in this book, and I'm really oversimplifying things here. Uh, there's, there's a lot of arguments that he has. But the kind of main reason that he talks about is that uh, there's global economic inequality because of where people decided to live and where the kinds of resources that they had. And then uh, basically you add in uh, disease and then you get where we're at today. Well, anthropologists and archeologists did not like this interpretation. And they basically said that is biologically and environmentally deterministic, right? Um, you basically say there's global economic inequality because there are poor people because of where they chose to live. Could it not have something to do with how uh, basically global policy treats people with less? Um, this was the kind of, this basically got anthropologists' eyes open. Um, then in 20, uh, 2004, um, Jared Diamond publishes a book called Collapse. And this one was very much got the attention of archeologists. And what he argues in this book, right? And you can actually see it in the title. It's how societies choose to basically <laughs> uh, fail or succeed. Um, and this was a very strange kind of way of thinking about um, how, how societies end. And he uses very dramatic language called collapse. Um, and the, one of the main arguments that he pretty much puts forward, he goes into different archeological kind of contexts in this book. And he says, this, these are all the ways that uh, societies chose to uh, overshoot their environment and their resources and why they failed. Um, and archeologists responded in kind and said, that is not the, the narrative uh, necessarily of the uh, global human story. Um, I see something popped up in the chat. Uh, so I see someone said, love collapse. Archaeologists, um, uh, oh, hold on, looks like my pointer went away. Oh, we're back. Um, Archaeologists, um, some liked this book, um, some like Jared Diamond's books, others really did not. This was a big, um, a big uh, uh, debate. Um, how, what is the nature of human resilience um, and the sustainability of resource use with humans? Um, so, and we sh we're still talking about this, but at this time we have this flurry of like publications. People are calling Jared Diamond racist. Um, they're, they're telling him he's environmentally and biologically deterministic, um, uh, basically saying that there are no social process and processes involved in any of these things. Um, they're shouting him down at conferences and kind of all of this, uh, very dramatic. And then in 2012, Diamond publishes this book, 
called The World Until Yesterday, um, where he kind of he, he kind of tries to, I guess, soften his stance. It seems this is a very critical interpretation of what he was trying to do, but it seems like he was trying to look at the academic community and say, no, 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 I'm not saying we have nothing to learn from traditional societies. Uh, and he publishes this book. Um, and the response to this was uh, pretty, uh, th this book, this is kind of almost like a, a book review of this book, of uh, The World Until Yesterday. And you can see from the title that people were not impressed, okay? And this all, my anxiety <laughs> around this debate, my, the, the development of my insecurities as a young scholar um, interested in zooarchaeology and the environment and anthropology centered around this topic. Um, of environmental determinism, right? So saying that the environment dictates what humans do. Um, so I'm sitting here really interested in environmental processes and human foraging behavior. Uh, and then in the discipline in my mind is raging over this question uh, about environmental determinism. So in so many words, the insecurity I start developing is, is am I even an anthropologist or archeologist? And this all hinges on the, the nature culture dichotomy, right? Um, so I hope that all kind of makes sense going forward. If you've got any questions about that, just put them in the chat and I'll try to get to them. Um, so now we're moving on to part two of this talk. <laughs> These are the, uh, the, the coping mechanisms. Um, and I, the, my, the, my anxiety about environmental determinism, ooh, I see we've got something in the chat. <laughs> Loa says, yes, John, you are an anthropologist. Thank you, Loa, that means a lot. Um, my, my anxiety about this starts to subside once I get a little more experience in the discipline. It never fully goes away, I could probably argue. Um, but I start understanding that the, the this this debate about environmental determinism is not really anything new. Um, so, and then I kind of start coping both in good and probably bad ways. Um, and so in terms of this not being new, this is Julian Stewart. Julian Stewart, uh, and he's sitting here in what I like to call the zoo archeology span pose, right? Someone basically pointed a camera at, at Stewart and said, um, do something sciencey. And he picked up a vertebra, a bone, and then you looked at it, and this often, <laughs> this often um, happens with with a lot of zooarchaeologists when they're getting their picture taken in the lab. So Julian Stewart is practically the face of uh, of a paradigm in anthropology um, called the cultural ecology, and this is kind of in the I guess 40s, 50s, and 60s maybe, uh, is the heyday of cultural ecology. And cultural ecologists, in a nutshell, were obsessed with understanding cultural similarities and differences in terms of the environment. So why are these two cultures similar? Well, a, cult, or a cultural anthropologist or a cultural ecologist would say, well, it must be because they are in similar environments and they adapted similarly. Um, but people kind of start catching on to these arguments that the cultural ecologists are making. And they say, well, hey, this seems a little simplistic, don't you think? So for instance, um, why did agriculture independently develop in different environments across the globe? Uh, and the cultural ecologists would say, oh, uh, we'll get back to you on this. <laughs> so in short, people are saying cultural ecologists are a little environmentally deterministic. However, cultural, the cultural ecologists did do a lot for interpreting a range of complex behavior, socio-political group structure in the face of complex environmental processes. So um, we kind of move forward in the discipline, taking the good and throwing out the bad with cultural ecology. So I started kind of learning about this and I, I started feeling a little bit better about my anxieties. And then it wasn't actually until recently that I have um, really started coping. And it's because of this thing called the ontological turn. Um, and my reading of the ontological term, it is a very broad and dense literature. So my reading of it might be very different than someone else's. So I would love to talk about this at the end um, of the lecture or right now, if someone has got a different view on things. Um, so 
uh, I, I think we've come back to thinking about tenants of cultural ecology, of cultural ecology, but in some different ways. We've started thinking more about how environments, uh, individual animals, or groups of animals. That's what I'm really talking about today. I'm getting to fishing, right? Um, and even material objects. We're talking about just objects themselves. How they actually partially structure shared realities. Okay, and this is what we're talking about with this this kind of fancy word ontology. So said in a different way, the ontological term, it really denotes a, a theoretical perspective that, um, that there isn't one, simply one simple reality um, that humans and all of the things we encounter at multiple different scales have their own separate realities and that these realities are sometimes shared in vast networks. Um, further, the reality is these realities aren't given meaning by humans alone. So these different and shared realities have meaning that is co-constituted. Um, and so this all sounds like a like really heavy philosophical stuff. But for our pur purposes today, all I'm saying, the, this kind of ontological perspective, ontological turn perspective is saying is that non-human stuff can have immense agency and can be a force of change in human lives for reasons that aren't totally related to human perception, okay? So humans don't necessarily structure the world in isolation. We help structure it, sometimes playing no role whatsoever, sometimes playing more of a role, sometimes playing a little bit less of a role. Um, and this is how I've started to kind of view um, uh, my work is in terms of this. Um, and so what I'm gonna kind of do, so in terms of, cultural ecology, it really kind of, this brings cultural ecology into kind of like a modern view. Um, this, um, so as anthropologists have kind of started to ask, especially with animals uh, or organisms, how they and their interrelationships have helped structure these human realities that I keep talking about. How can both non-human organisms and humans construct shared ones? And that's how I've started thinking about my archeological research. But what I want to do right now is I want to give you some of my favorite examples of more kind of in terms of um, human animal studies um, and actually not necessarily going off into actually garbage studies as well of things that I view as a that have a very ontological turn perspective. Um, we're going to talk about uh, cultural anthropologists. We're going to talk about historians um, and, and some, some different topics that they have, three different topics. So I want to introduce you first to the peregrine falcon. Um, the peregrine falcon, if people don't know, in the 50s and 60s, maybe a little bit into the 70s, was on its way out. Its it, population started crashing, um, and it's pretty much, it was the cause of this was DDT, which was a pesticide, right? So pesticides basically moved their way up into the food chain and accumulated into this top predator, um, and population started crashing. Um, and... Uh, it seemed like this bird was on its way out. It was going to go extinct. But some really concentrated conservation biology effort went into bringing it back. And now it is a complete success story. The peregrine falcon is doing good, relatively good. Um, and some of the efforts that went into this had, were, were, in terms of anthropologically speaking, complex. Um, and this is from one of my, I, I always talk about this book when I can, this Domestication Gone Wild book. I'm really uh, into raptors. Uh, I love thinking about them. And I especially like thinking about domestication. And the first chapter of this book is so good. It talks about breeding raptors, birds of prey, right? It's called Breeding with Birds of Prey. And it's about, it's by Sarah Asu Schroeder. And she talks about how th these intimate relationships in terms of trying to bring falcons like the peregrine falcon back in conservation to breed them um, are, are so, uh, are, they're just so intimate. Um, how these birds, these, these, these falcons have such agency in structuring their own human conservation. Um, it's a real trip to kind of thinking about, to, to think about. One of the things that kind of brings this up uh, or really highlights this point is these, these, these hats. These have been referred to as 
falcon sex hats, okay? The idea here is that breeding falcons and breeding raptors in general is extremely difficult. They have very specific courting behavior. Um, they, have, they, they have a lot of needs, okay? And so for a human to actually breed them, these, the, the breeders actually have to develop relationships with these raptors. Both male and females have different behaviors. It involves getting to know them. It involves uh, knowing their biology and reproductive biology and ecology, how they, you, you can kind of dance around in a certain way. You can avert your eyes or look or kind of move. These breeders have to learn all of these kind of intimate relationships with all these different individual birds. When it comes to breeding a, a male falcon, they wear these hats, right? And the idea is actually these hats collect semen. So when the, when the male is ready, it jumps up on the hat and then the, the, inseminates the hat. And then this, the semen can be collected and then in a syringe, and then they can start this process over again with a female and then inseminate the female. So, Sarah Sue Schroer's point here is that in terms of this domestication kind of relationship, right, breeding is a huge part of the domestication relationship, controlled breeding, that it's not necessarily controlled, right? This raptor has a lot of agency in its own conservation, um, that it's a, a very careful negotiation. Um, and I, that is a very ontological kind of perspective in my mind. Um, I think that's really interesting to think about. I want to um, introduce you to the Texas Longhorn. <clears throat> so this is a historian that has taken a um, really uh, ontological, I think, perspective with the Texas Longhorn. His name is Joshua Specht. Uh, and he has argued that the Texas Longhorn has been both a technology for colonialism, so back when it was introduced onto rangelands, and that more, more, in more modern times, that it's actually an agent uh, for maintaining current ranching practices. Um, so when we think about the Texas Longhorn, it was first prized for its individualistic qualities. It is an extremely hardy and tough animal that fit well, right? Into the, there was a very hands-off approach to a, with American ranching practices. This animal was able to hold its own in the West, okay? So in essence, this breed of cattle due to its own biological and ecological qualities could take the West, literally take the West with little effort on the parts of humans. And as such, it was an efficient technology for colonialism, okay? And I like this picture because it just shows like this, you know, longhorn, like, hey, what's up? Super tough animal, okay? It could just be left alone and, and graze and leftover winters and take land as it went west. However, there were clear business decisions that were made with the Texas Longhorn. See something in the chat? They are surly as well. Yes, <laughs> yes, they are surly. Um, they're, they're, they are a tough animal. Um, so, but, so they were used in initial going West in Texas, right? Um, but there were clear business decisions that were made, okay, with the Texas Longhorn. So after the West was won, um, these decisions were to stop breeding Longhorns. The main reason is one, they tasted awful. Um, just people that would actually eat them would say like, this tastes like eating a boot. Um, and that, so there wasn't really a good business decision to put so much effort into um, ranching these cattle. And that there were all, also, um, they were very surly, as T pointed out, they were very surly to handle, and they weren't very well um, matched to industrialized ranching practices that were developing at the time. They wanted a more tasty and docile, <laughs> right, cow. So the West had been won already. And the, you know, they, they went out and got it, uh, but then it starts changing. But the actual, like the, the, what the Longhorn represented to begin with has been mythologized in Texas. There's a whole new meaning to the Texas Longhorn. It serves as a symbol to harken back to like a bygone time when ranchers and their cattle, cattle were tough and individualistic. 
And what Joshua Specht argues is that this has actually helped mask the real business and industrial decisions that have shaped ranchers and ranching policy in Texas today, right? By taking this, basically what, by, by taking and mythologizing the Texas Longhorn. So basically what I, Specht, Specht doesn't say this, but what I summarize this as is Specht is saying the Longhorn is, is used as propaganda for the cattle beef techno complex in Texas. Um, and this is all predicated on the biology and behavior of this animal that has shaped an entire region or an entire industry. That is a pretty, in my mind, ontological perspective, ontological turn perspective, I should say. Now we're gonna move kind of away from animals for a second, but then we're gonna get back to them with trash. This is another researcher that I, he's an anthropologist that I really like. His name is Joshua Reno. Um, and he has applied this kind of ontological turn perspective with landfills and trash. And his main argument is if we could view uh, like basically trash as something that is actually active, like that has agency in our lives, then perhaps it would go a long way in helping to solve current waste and pollution problems across the globe. He's saying essentially, we need to stop distancing trash from ourselves and we need to stop thinking about trash as dead and discarded, okay? He's also argued that it would be especially helpful to think about trash in terms of human biology, where trash is actually a sign of life, right? Sign that of where something living was there. And he, he uses this kind of sign of life um, kind of saying, um, and he makes kind of a, an analogy with how biologists study scat of animals, right? How it's a sign of life. Um, and and the, the, the scat is an active agent. Um, but how an archeologist would really say this in kind of more sciencey terms um, is that it's, it's part of the extended phenotype, right? Um, one of the things and one of the examples that I really like that, that Specht brings up um, as he highlights uh, the like Pueblo conceptions of and perceptions of trash. And so this in the, in the Southwest, um, especially in the Mesa Verde area, we are very used to seeing these things called Pruden units, where you have a room block to the north, and then to the south, there's this, there's a kiva, a subterranean structure. And then to the south of that, there are these things called middens, which are basically garbage, trash, heaps, dumps, whatever, however you want to think about it. Okay. But in and Pueblo views, refuse, refuse is linked to signs of life, okay? Um, so middens are linked to ancestors and that literally the dust and ash that are present symbolize the continual reproduction of like the hearth and the home and therefore life, if that makes sense. There was a sign of life there, therefore it is, it is a part of continual life. There is also an other than human being connected to these spots that's called Ash Boy, who controls and oversees uh, ceremonies and the rededic rededication of kivas. So again, the point here is that even non-animate material objects can have their own realities, which can serve to animate them and make them forces in people's lives. That's what these three examples I have tried to kind of show with that. Um, I, hope, I, hope that I hope it makes sense. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about kind of moving forward. Um, and now we're gonna get into Pueblo fishing. Are there any questions, things that need a little more explaining maybe? Okay. So I'm really interested in food and food ways, okay? And when I say food ways, basically all I mean is, how and why people get and use food, right? And how that has happened through time and how that has changed or stayed the same. Um, and so normally though, in, in the Southwest, in the American Southwest and in the archeological literature, there's a very specific way of talking about food ways. Um, and it involves diet, okay? And diet is thought to have, to like the diet of people is thought to be controlled by biological and environmental constraints, okay? So it's literally interpreted as like, what are people like eating 
and how is it filling biological roles and like physiological roles and how did the environment provide that and then it's juxtaposed to cuisine and what is thought to control this in people's food ways is our more social things um, and and what what this actually means is kind of vague is left pretty vague which has frustrated me <laughs> a little bit um, so, oh man, this got messed up. This was supposed to be, this was supposed to be the say nature. Oh my God. Uh, anyway, so how I've interpreted this is that this kind of diet cuisine uh, dichotomy was, was, is basically a reinterpretation of the nature culture dichotomy, right? Um, and that we, we kind of understand that there's a, a, how this is perceived or how this is talked about is we understand that there's an overlap between these things, um, but really they're kind of separate things. Um, but how much overlap there is between diet and cuisine, lot, little bit, or if they're just completely separate things, this is never really talked about. And in my perspective, I kind of think they're, I don't know if we should be separating these things. The I, it, it would be better to talk about it in terms of just food getting. So my point is that if we're so worried, like I used to be and still kind of am, uh, about which one constitutes nature or culture, then we're going to miss out on these shared co-constituted realities, right, in the past or today. So, and this is exactly what the ontological turn is all about. Um, so one of the things that I'm kind of going to speak for Emily here, and I hope it's okay. One of the things that I used to do in my writing was I used to actually wholeheartedly take this kind of diet, cuisine, nature, culture dichotomy um, and label things as that. And then I would try to get to this point of like, maybe there's more overlap than we're, we're thinking about in terms of how people get their food and make food choices. Um, but Emily would get maybe a little frustrated with me and say, well, by wholeheartedly buying into this separation, you're just undermining yourself. You've got to stop writing like this. And, and I think Emily was right. Um, and I'm trying to move forward with it and, and my dissertation research in this way. Um, and so I'm kind of, going to do a really brief run through of that. I might move pretty fast. Uh, uh, we've got a little bit. Let's see. There's something in the chat. <laughs> oh, no, not everyone wants <laughs> knows what a cranky commenter I am. <laughs> no, those were good comments. Uh, I needed to I needed to cope. <laughs> so in my dissertation research, I'm particularly interested in ancestral, I already said ancestral Pueblo food, but I'm interested in fishing and how environmental change around the late pre-Hispanic period here in the middle Rio Grande um, could have impacted fishing and, and food. Um, so this, this period is interesting from an environmental point of view because it roughly marks the end of what is known as the medieval warm period, which is just a period of prolonged drought across the American Southwest and Mexican Northwest. Um, and we know that the end of this drought impacted aquatic habitat quality in the Rio Grande. There are the, the paleozoological record, basically animal remains from the past, show us that different species of fish with very particular ecological tolerances, um, like stream flow or stream clarity preferences were present when they are absent now. Um, and so when we kind of, when we look at the entire state in terms of where different sites are where fish remains have been recovered, it's normally thought that fishing was not very important in, in the ancestral Pueblo world. My whole dissertation is saying, I don't think we should keep going with this idea. Um, and there might be some really productive ways we can start thinking about this and incorporating ancestral Pueblo fishing into anthropology. So when we think about all the different sites where fishes are present, generally, roughly speaking, the majority of them are in the middle Rio Grande hydrological basin, which is where we are right now, uh, and about a 50 it's about 50%, over 50% of the sites. And of these sites, the majority of these are during this late kind of pre-Hispanic period in the middle Rio Grande. Um, so, so there's ha something happening here, I think, with the linkage between environmental change and something's going on with fishing. And so what I'm really interested in doing is um, uh, taking a food web approach 
Um, and I have not written about this, this like this, but this is kind of how I think about it. Um, I'm interested in the agency of ecological communities themselves, right? And using food webs to talk about those things. So that's this, you know, commu this ecological community is represented in this food web. But what is this food web or community's role in changing or helping structure or whatever human foraging decisions? And I'm particularly interested in, in kind of uh, measuring different uh, or gauging different qualities of ecological communities um, that humans relied on for food uh, using stable isotope analysis. Um, and so the, I, my I, whole thing here is this could basically help us think about this linkage between food choice and uh, fishing and environmental conditions. And I just briefly want to talk about how to kind of read this chart. I'll go fast. This is called delta carbon 13. This is just carbon isotopes. Uh, and what we can do with these isotopes, right, we can run um, tissues of different organisms like plants or animals, and they'll pop up in different spots in this graph. And what they'll do is with this carbon axis, it's all based on what kind of foods that different organisms or the plants themselves, how they process and use carbon. Um, if you plot over here on, on the graph, you do this plant does photosynthesis in a very different way. This is called C3 photosynthesis. Basically, this is like the majority of vegetation on the planet does photosynthesis like this. If, if you're a fish or a human that plots over here, this means that you have somehow in the food web relied on a lot of plants like this. So it's a way to identify resource types. However, there's a different um, photosynthetic pathway that's called the C4 pathway. There's a lot of arid grasses in the Southwest that plot over here. Corn also plots over here. So if you know we ran some of your hair uh, and you, you eat a lot of corn, you'd plot over here. Um, in terms of nitrogen, this is just called delta nitrogen 15. Um, say if you're a fish, which is what I'm really interested in, you're gonna see fish fishes plotted out in this graph. Um, this me basically measures how high on the food web you are or on the food chain you are. The, if you're higher up here, maybe you're like this gar, really carnivorous. If you're lower, maybe you're like this sucker right here that eats a whole bunch of algae, okay? If there's any questions about that, just let me know. We can talk about it later. So what I'm gonna talk about right now is kind of how I've gone about gauging the qualities, right? And um, of these, these food webs um, in the past. So this is work from um, that, that I and colleagues recently published on. So basically what we did is we identified the different carbon sources that route through the aquatic middle Rio Grande. Um, so you can see terrestrial C3 plants are here. Um, algae within stream algae is here. And then terrestrial C4 plants like arid land grasses are over here. Uh, and then what we wanted to do, we show that fishes from modern contexts, from historical contexts, the dates are here. And these basically ellipses, uh, just like the average area that these, these different scatters take up from these different communities. These, each one of these is like a little fish bone that we ran the collagen of. Um, we show that fishes from modern contexts rely on incredibly fast resource channels, which is this algae here. Um, and we can talk more about this too. I'm kind of going a little fast. Um, but what we showed was that archaeological fishes, these ones over here, are, are composed of different resource types. Um, they're actually pooled a little more over to this area. Um, and that, that would mean that a slower energy source, C4 plants are really hard for ecosystems to break down, um, that they actually paired different resource channels. And this channeling, this pairing of different resource channels helps stabilize um, the, the fish communities in the past. It allows for asynchronous resource depletion in the food web as a whole. So basically, this is all just a long way of saying that we think that fishes were more stable and a less ris risky resource for, uh, for Pueblo fishers in the past. Now, I think this has to do with environmental change, um, but uh, I, it might be possible that actually floodplain farming along the Rio Grande actual like the farming of corn brought in more detritus into the food web from that resource and helped stabilize fishes, which then helped increase 
um, fishing behavior, um, kind of showing how entangled, right, environmental change, fish communities, and Pueblo food decisions are. That's kind of my point in all of this. But this is not to say that fishing is only done for food. Um, there are, could be a lot of different reasons that fishes are, are caught um, in the middle Rio Grande, but it cannot, in my, my mind, be disentangled from this larger shared reality of these environmental conditions, right? Um, so this is important information to know in terms of this, this kind of shared reality. I hope that makes sense. This has been interpreted to be a gar on, um, on a petroglyph from Petroglyph National Monument. Um, this is a pendant made from a, so we know that fish bones were used for ornamentation, um, made from this opercle, it's like a gill flap. This um, is actually a, uh, a hook or an awl or a needle that I found the other day in collections that's made from uh, a fish rib. Let's see, something in the chat. Uh, uh, we can get back to this T. So if there was evidence of population maintenance and control over in Pueblo fish populations, I, there's not direct evidence of that yet. Um, I'm saying it's a possibility based on the stable isotope data, um, but I actually have other reasons to believe that I think the, the kind of what we're seeing in terms of fishing behavior is really linked to environmental change. Uh, we can talk more about that. I'm going to look back at this. Yeah. No, no, no. Don't be sorry. I said you could totally. I wanted to keep this like this. Um, so, I mean, that, again, I just want to reiterate, this is how I've kind of come to think about the nature-culture dichotomy, <laughs> kind of um, looking at the agency of non-human animals and their communities, um, and then looking at these kind of shared realities. I hope, I hope this kind of made sense. Um, we'll talk more about it. So I just wanted to say thank you to all these all these different people. Thank you so much to Emily for all of her patience, and thank you for um, thank you to the UNM Department of Anthropology um, for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Sorry if that was a little meandery, y'all. <laughs> no, that was wonderful. Thanks, John. I really uh, that was that was I I love the 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 personal. Um, the personal approach you took. Um, so if anybody has any questions for John, please just go ahead and turn on your, your camera and go ahead and ask a question. Or type the question in the chat. Everyone's like, I don't know what to make of what he just said. <laughs> Well, I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, I, I uh, again, I really appreciated the the way that you you presented this, and um, I, 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 you know, my a lot of my uh, <clears throat> young adult life was spent thinking about, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a part of nature or not a part of nature? Or, you know, what are humans in the in the natural world? So I, I uh, and I still think that that sort of motivates some of the questions that I ask in my own research. So I, I think it is helpful to have those sort of metaphysical questions almost that sort of drive uh, drive you. And I, it's it's cool to see that you, you have very similar ones to me. Um, but I do have a question about the examples that you gave about um, hu human and um, uh, animal relationships, uh, or you know, non-human animal relationships, uh, uh, were all about sort of domestic animals or um, animals that have undergone some degree of domestication. And I'm wondering if you've thought about uh, similar sorts of relationships that uh, exist uh, among humans and and wild animals or non-domesticated animals. One one exa potential example of uh, this sort of relationship that comes to mind is like these honey guide uh, uh, birds in in East Africa. Uh, that that um, people ha have these symbiotic relationships with that that sort of guide them to honey and um, and depending on who you talk to uh, receive honey as a result of guiding people to the honey. Uh, but uh, but anyway, I'm just curious about if, how your thinking uh, might be applied to wild animals. So so I, I want to make a point that that um, <laughs> that Emily and I talk about all the time is that like the dom domestication is a spectrum, right? Um, and so that the Texas Longhorn, that yes, domesticated, but those those falcons, right? Those are occupying the middle space, and that is why I'm so. And you could argue, 
successfully, I think that they're, those are wild. Those are not domesticates, but they're being bred, right? So then they're in this middle space. But how I think about the whole range of this, I think about fishing in terms of wild animals. And then I think about, um, I think a lot about deer and artiodactyls and bison and what, what is driving different people's decisions about food and how the environment changes that. So uh, with fishes particularly, it's the stability. And I, I, I don't think I illustrated that very well. Um, it's, that's when, I, when I'm thinking about wild resources, stability and body size are actually the things that I think about the most um, right now because that's what I've been working on. Um, and how those different things can combine and then impact human foraging decisions. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, does, uh, it de definitely makes sense, yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna jump in here because we can't talk about, like as John said, this is something we talk about all the time and I'm really, it's something that I'm engaging with a lot these days too. But we might, thinking about um, the wild domestic dichotomy might also be intimate related, intimately related to this thinking about the nature culture dichotomy that in fact, especially when we're talking about animals, there's no animal in the world these days that hasn't been really impacted by humans and that right. isn't in turn impacting us. And so it's, this is really all along this gradient. Um, and I'm not sure that the, I'm not sure that the wild domestic dichotomy is really helping us these days with many questions anyway. That makes sense. Yeah, great. Thatcher has a very specific question that I'm glad he asked. So he says, um, how might changes in the riverine conditions along the middle Rio Grande during the P4 have constrained improved fishing locales? Do you think fishing was prevalent prior to P4 population integration in the, the middle Rio Grande? Um, so this is like super detailed. <laughs> how, what I think is happening here in terms of actual fishing localities is that we have kind of made the argument that there's more flooding, right, in the Rio Grande during the spring, right? Snow melt, all of that. There's this is where all this nutrient exchange is coming from, from those C4 plants. Um, but when there's some evidence out there that fishing was really going on seasonally speaking in the late summer and um, early fall, and that basically this is when you know there's monsoon rains, um, but the, the flows in the Rio Grande are low near their baseline and fishes could have likely have been collected in pools, kind of dried up pools. But the stability of those fishes, right, is connected to earlier in, in the spring. It's a really kind of complex argument, I, I know, but it's, that's what I think is actually driving these localities. Um, but you got to think that anything that was pooled for a long period of time would be really uh, an, an unstable resource to be picking on. Um, but if people would have known that they could rely and get something within these pools, um, that's what that's kind of the whole this whole shared reality thing that I'm talking about. That I was trying to point towards. Um, and do you think fishing was prevalent before uh, population aggregation in the middle Rio Grande? I do not think it was as prevalent. No, there is evidence of it. Um, but it is definitely not as prevalent in terms of ubiquity um, and how everywhere fish were in small quantities in the middle Rio Grande. Did, did, Thatcher, did that make sense? Yeah, good response, John, thanks. I, <laughs> I just have, uh, have, I've got the blank screens. <laughs> Any other questions? I've got I've got one um, okay. that John is going to also say is way too specific. How do you see the difference between um, let's call it P4 fishing in the northern Rio Grande um, aggregation versus P4 fishing in say the middle and the lower Rio Grande? You know, honestly, uh, this is a question I'm really interested in. But in terms of taxa, it's 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 suckers. <laughs> Like um, catastomidae or sucker fishes, um, those are the those are the main ones that I've been interested in. Northern Rio Grande and Middle Rio Grande, I don't know if there's enough data yet. I would love to be able to do a, like a regional comparison in the future to really talk about this. But right now, uh, from the ethnographic reading of how fishes are procured, it's mainly through non-targeted kind of a, like approaches with nets, um, like through seining the big like yucca net um that i mean there's a lot of there's more similarities my impression right now is there are more similarities than differences 
Hey, John, I have a question um, before we end. <clears throat> You've talked mostly about relationships between, um, for your research, between fish and humans in terms of feeding. Um, but where I work in the Pacific, there are these interesting relationships between seabirds, fish, and humans. Um, seabirds are helpful for navigation. Uh, seabirds also can identify places where fish are aggregating so that uh, they can be targeted for fishing as well. Mm -hmm. So have you looked at those sort of multiple relationships where it's uh, animal to animal to human it's, in terms of this relationship? Michael, this is a, such a, it's such a like on point question because Francis has actually, I don't know, I don't think Francis is here, but she actually, cause so I have like projects on raptors that I'm constantly thinking about and fishes and both like raptor use increases in the P4 in this P4 period. And we're, right when I'm saying there's like this little increase in, in, you know, fishing and Francis has been pushing me like, or has pushed me, you should think about the connection between these two things, because raptors sure do like fish. Um, and so kind of what this kind of all would mean uh, in this kind of more connected way. So my answer to the question is, I have not thought really hard about that, but it's on my radar. I would throw in as part of this, it's not just raptors, but birds in general, and particularly right. water birds in the middle of Rio Grande and the Pueblo Four right. are, I mean, they, just like fish, there's this huge spike. And there are a couple students who are working on different aspects of this. Um, and it it is another one of those ones where it's really interesting to tease out whether this, yeah. you know, what exactly is driving this? Clearly there is an environmental indicator going on. There's also a lot of change, um, social change that probably has something to do with why people are interacting with birds the way that they are. And the connection with fish, I, I, I mean, I think the connection with fishes is likely there as well. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, Robin Cordero is the one that has done a lot of work with just the like, birds in the Rio in general. And there's a lot of parallels between our work, but we've like, like Emily was saying, was teased out these different parts of these questions and kind of measured these things in different ways. It is really interesting to think about. Someone said in the chat, are, are suckers really that tasty? <laughs> um, I've heard mixed reviews <laughs> uh, about that. So, and then he says, so is there a chance of a type of falconing for fish here? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, in terms of raptor management and how they would be taking fish, big birds like fish for some reason, or big raptors rather, um, like, like fishes. Anyone else? Any other questions? <laughs> All right, Thatcher. Yeah, you can you can pepper him with questions uh, afterwards. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Thank you, John. That was really really uh, great. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah.